Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is the International Space Station. We are ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? I've got you loud and clear. How do you hear us? Loud and clear. Hello, I'm Senator Roger Wicker from Mississippi. Congratulations. As delegates to the U.S. Senate Youth Program, you're part of a great tradition. It's an opportunity for you to hear from today's leaders and to become the leaders of tomorrow. You're about to experience a rare opportunity hearing from astronauts live aboard the International Space Station. As a member of the Senate Committee that oversees NASA, I believe these young leaders are among America's finest. Their work is an important investment in our future. I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Frank and I attend Howard W. Blake High School in Tampa, Florida. My question is that since we process time of day based on daylight, and since the International Space Station has different daylight hours, what's the difference in how you experience time? Thank you. Hey, that is a great question. Because we're orbiting the Earth, we're in different periods of orbital daylight and orbital night 16 times a day. So how do you pick what your time is? We actually go with Greenwich Mean Time, and so uh, that's, that's in Europe. This helps because we have control centers both in the United States and in Russia, as well as in Europe and Japan. It picks one time for all the control centers, and it kind of splits the difference so that our shift workers are coming in sometimes at crazy hours of the night, uh, but sometimes it's their normal work day. Hi, my name is Sabine Mead and I'm from Virginia. My question is, how does space exploration benefit civilians and society as a whole? That's a really great question. And, you know, we develop technologies and ways of using those technologies, healthcare and medical technologies that are ways to improve life on Earth, but even more important than that, I believe, in addition to the technologies and all of the commercial activity that space is generating, space has some a way of universally inspiring people. Making folks want to do very challenging things to the best of their ability is what I think human space exploration does most for humankind. Hi, my name's Kenneth Yu, and I'm from Michigan. My question is, how has the variation in native languages spoken by astronauts aboard the International Space Station affected the way you communicate with one another? This is a really good question. And actually, one of the questions we get a lot of time is, uh, what do you need to know to be an astronaut? One of the things you do need to know is language. So uh, we all study Russian, and our cosmonaut counterparts study English. It ends up sometimes being kind of a strange mix. We call it Runglish. It's uh, whatever word is the best thing that you can use to communicate. Uh, we also have European partners. We have uh, Japanese partners. And we have Canadian partners who are sometimes French speakers. And so it can be quite a mix of languages up here. The important thing is to be able to speak a lot of different languages and to be able to communicate with your crewmates. And so we do that uh, oftentimes by training together. We learn uh, each other's languages and we learn how to work together is probably, it's, it's one of the critical things for our high functioning team. Hi, my name is Eric Samal and I'm from New Mexico. My question is, based on current research and developments in the space industry, what role in space do you think humans will play in the next few decades? That's a great question, and there are a lot of levels to that. So from the, you know, like I said, the, the ground level, sort of the operational bringing together the, the, the finite plans and the long-term plans, and then at the strategic level, humans are going to play important roles in all of that. Uh, as we venture out uh, further from home to, to the moon and to Mars, you've got the human aspect of sending people in addition to our robotic exploration uh, programs, but also back on Earth. All of those people that go have families that they're going to uh, be away from. And so the human aspect of human space exploration is always going to be very important, I think, for decades to come. 
Hi, my name is Archer Taylor and I'm from Mississippi. My question is, are you able to see space debris from where you are located? It's a, that is a really good question. So we normally can't see the smaller space debris, but we do see evidence of it uh, out on the space station itself on the exterior. So uh, Victor and I have both done spacewalks recently, and we certainly can see um, essentially a, a history. It, it's, it's a pockmarked station. We do see these even fine grains of sand. We can see that uh, evidence uh, on the space station. It, you can't really see a lot of that small space debris as it's going past. Uh, but you can see things like we just released an external pallet from the space station. That was the size of a Suburban, and we could see that for quite some time. It was actually it was very surprising to me. Um, you know, three hours, four hours later, we could still see uh, it. Now, granted, it was three kilometers away, but it was a Suburban size uh, a piece of equipment that was intentionally released and is controlled and managed. Um, but we did have a visual on that at three kilometers because of the way the sun was shining. Uh, and so you can see things when they're illuminated in space. It was, that was a bit surprising to me. Great question. Hi, my name is Anna McLennan and I'm from Ohio. My question is why do you think it is important to fund and value space exploration, scientific research, and STEM education? I could spend this entire time talking about that. I, I think it's important for young people to be motivated to go out and do challenging and difficult things. Um, one, one of the great benefits of doing that is not just what you learn specifically, but it's training yourself to acquire challenging things. If you learn to speak a foreign language, learn to, to do differential equations, you learn to, to, to paint or sculpt, you're, you're gaining a specific skill, but then you're also gaining the ability to acquire skills, and I think that that is, is hugely valuable. I could go in, into much more detail, but that is a great question, and it is critical to the future of our country, to our economy, and to humanity in general. Hi, my name is Ashley Hernandez, and I attend Clifton High School in New Jersey. My question is, how has your perspective on life and humanity developed since you boarded the International Space Station? Actually, that's a really good question. Um, it, people talk about this a lot. They call it the overview effect, and, and it's kind of a known phenomenon when astronauts get up to the space station and when we see the Earth. And I think my perspective has changed in two ways. Uh, one is being able to see the planet. It is so beautiful. I, I mean, it's striking, and we've seen it in, in TV shows and movies and documentaries, but there's nothing quite like seeing it visually, I think, because it is so bright and it's also so isolated. So we get this sense of how huge the planet is and how bright and how glowing, but also how alone we are. I mean, truly alone in the blackness of space, and we are all on this planet. So as you can imagine, the, this you know, prompts a whole lot of really deep thoughts uh, about humanity and our, and our beautiful planet that's our home. Uh, and I think it just changes something in the fundamental understanding of the way that we view um, our species, all of us together, uh, where we live, and where we are in the universe. Hi, my name is Ashley Bawa, and I attend Waipao High School in Hawaii. My question is, what is your favorite food on Earth and in the International Space Station? My favorite food on Earth, wow, I like so many of them, it's hard to pick just one, but pretty much anything from a Moroccan or an Indian restaurant is, uh, is going to be on that list. And in space, it's a treat to get things like that because we are able to get uh, various cuisines sent up special uh, for each of us. But I, I would say the thing I eat the most that I really enjoy are dried apricots. We have plenty of those. They're a, a regular part of our menu, and I could eat those all day long. Hi, my name is David Smith, and I attend Grassfield High School in Virginia. My question is, what kind of work do you personally perform on the International Space Station, or what specific research are you involved in? 
That is a really great question. We are pretty busy up here. We've got about 12-hour days. Um, a lot of our time is spent doing research, and so we do experiments, everything from Cold Atom Lab, which is looking at uh, fundamental properties of atoms and physics, fundamental physics. I'm a biologist. Uh, I get pretty excited about the biology experiments up here. We do a lot of molecular and cellular biology. Uh, we also do a lot of material science up here. Things change in orbit, uh, the way fluids behave changes, and the way combustion happens changes, and, um, and the way that fluids uh, interact with their surrounding material environment. Um, and we've got a lot of experiments uh, on the outside of the space station, and we spend a fair amount of time inside the space station maintaining the space station. So we have to keep our environmental life support running. Uh, we do actually quite a bit of maintenance up here. It's pretty much split between maintenance and research, uh, and then a few spacewalks thrown in and some visiting vehicle robotics captures. Hi, my name is Caden Berkman, and I'm from Dodea. And my question is, as individuals living aboard the International Space Station, is it difficult to keep up with current events happening on Earth? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I would say we spend a majority of our free time trying to reconnect with what's going on on Earth, our specific families, uh, but also staying abreast of what's going on. We are able to get the news, but we are very dependent on the ground for that. We have an Internet system that allows us to, to check up on things uh, on a regular basis, but, you know, that can be shut down as it was uh, not too long ago uh, for, for cybersecurity reasons. And so we, we have... Um, a reliance on our ground team to, to help keep us updated, but we are able to, to keep in touch with our families, which I think is a very important part of, of staying connected to Earth. Great question. Hello, I'm Jack Peranick, and I'm from Massachusetts. My question is, how will the growing presence of space junk in low Earth orbit make maintaining orbital stations more difficult in the next decade? Jack, that is a really great question. It's very topical. Um, there's a lot of folks, you know, policy folks, and, and this really affects everything from civil space to military to research spacecraft. So everybody who uses the domain of space thinks about it. it it's an issue. Um, it's, it's also an issue that can quickly get exponential. And so if you have some space junk and it collides with other space debris, it can, it, it sets off an exponential change. So this isn't a linear problem. Uh, we have a lot of folks tracking this. Um, some things that we can do at the federal level involve licensure. Uh, uh, we, we very carefully monitor who can launch, what they launch. We start to have things like deorbit plans, and we ensure that spacecraft that are launching have a plan for how they're going to, at the end of the life of their vehicle, uh, we can't just let this go free and start colliding with other pieces of space debris. If you're interested in this, it is a whole field that I would definitely recommend going into. It's not a problem that's been solved, and it's something we really need bright minds working on. Hi, I'm Josie Kaufman from South Dakota, and my question is, what is the training program like on Earth to prepare you for the zero gravity in space? Thank you. That's a great question. Our training program is pretty intense. It takes uh, about two and a half years to prepare for one of these missions, uh, learning your spacecraft as well as this spacecraft, uh, in addition to the one that's going to get you here. But to, to prepare for zero gravity is really uh, to train your imagination. You don't have any way on Earth that truly prepares you for what it's like to live here. This is our office, but it is also our home. And to go to sleep and to wake up the first night and day, full day that I spent in space was just a, an experience that nothing on Earth could prepare me for. And so it is really an exercise in the imagination because uh, the only way to know what it's like to, to live in microgravity is to, to actually live in microgravity. Hi, my name is Justin Su, and I attend the Charter School of Wilmington in Delaware. My question is, out of all the scientific research experiments that you've conducted aboard the space station, which has yielded the most surprising or unexpected result? That is 
is a great question, and this is a difficult one because we've done a lot of experiments up here, and I like to talk about them. Um, we we have done some really interesting work uh, with cardiomyocytes, and I was lucky enough to be up here in 2016 when we did the first uh, set of experiments, and we actually published that. That's a paper that you can go look up if you look at uh, cardiomyocytes in the International Space Station. We just did another round of this, and one of the very surprising things to me is the difference in cellular growth uh, in microgravity. I'm not sure that I was expecting it to be that different because cells are, are pretty small uh, and, and gravity as a force is you need something larger to, to really see some effects or lack of effects. But how the cellular tissue organizes and how these heart cells beat was actually pretty profoundly influenced by microgravity. And that was, even as a biologist, that was quite a surprising result. I think we've got a lot more work to do in that area. And so if this is biology, something that you're interested in, I definitely recommend looking at complex tissue organization further uh, in, in microgravity and how cells interact with fluids. A lot of those things are, are we're going to have see big differential effects on the International Space Station. Hi, my name is Katerina Kaur and I'm from New York. My question is, what is one thing that you experienced while in space that changed your perspective toward life on Earth? Earlier, Kate mentioned the overview effect, and I think one of the profound parts of that is to, to be able to use your own eyes and see the Earth as it is, without borders, without labels. There's no key legend when we look out of the cupola or the lab or the, the service module windows. We are able to see the Earth as it is, the weather, the deserts, the, the clouds, the ocean, the beauty of the ocean. I mean, the entire thing is striking in the daytime and, and at night. And it just made me appreciate it even more. And then looking at the atmosphere, that thin, beautiful line that separates, you know, living things down there from the vacuum up here, uh, it just uh, makes me appreciate how special it is for there to be life on our planet. Hi, my name is Miriam Nelson, and I'm from Massachusetts. My question is, what do you think the future of the United States' presence in space might look like? And what do you think the future of international presence in space might look like? Hey, Miriam, that is a great question. Certainly for the United States presence um, right now, we're, we're on board the International Space Station. This is an amazing, incredibly capable vehicle. Uh, we're working on expanding uh, this vehicle. So uh, Victor and I installed some things that are going to pave the way for new solar arrays. Uh, so that we can extend the life of the International Space Station. We also have several programs going on right now to further deep space exploration. So we've got a lot, if you, if you pay attention to things that are happening at NASA, we have got a lot going on uh, for development of systems that are going to take us to the moon and, and Mars and beyond in deep space exploration. I think for the international part of this, uh, we're going to do this internationally. This is how we have done space exploration for the last 20 years on the International Space Station, and it's really key to keeping uh, th this partnership it takes a lot of work. There's a lot of groundwork that goes into the partnership. And then once you've established a partnership, uh, it takes, takes work to maintain it, but it's not the huge effort that it was to set that up. And so we've got all this framework for international partnership. We know how to work with these other countries in space and, and building our space program. And we're going to keep that momentum going as we continue to push further into the solar system. Uh, that's what I see as the role for, for NASA coming up. We're mostly just pretty excited to be along for the ride and to get to work for this uh, space agency as Americans, it, it's truly an incredible opportunity and it's, a, it's just a wonderful job. Hi, my name is Emma Romano and I'm from Bridgeport High School in West Virginia. And my question is, what tasks and efforts are you participating in to help humans deal with climate change and other dangerous changes to the earth? One of the most important things I think we do with things in space, we have sensors, cameras, uh, other types of sensing, multispectral imaging that allow us to have the information about what our planet is doing. So being able to see the, the coastline and the changes in the coastline as, as sea levels rise and fall and oceans are, are uh, so, excuse me, lakes are, are drying up. And so to be able to have data to measure that, 
it's important to be able to quantify it so that you can then try to find ways to mitigate it, to change it, and do something about it. And so our efforts up here on the International Space Station, we have sensors that allow us, in addition with uh, our partnership with NOAA, we are able to, to, to measure some of the effects uh, of climate change and then do something about that. And so uh, we all have an opportunity uh, to, to learn about and to, um, uh, you know, make sure that, that the systems up here are maintained. Uh, we directly inside the space station don't do many experiments that are focused on climate change, but we are a part of a larger system that uh, enables us to, to measure so that we can then do something about the changing climate on our planet. Hello, my name is Raj Mia from the state of Florida, and my question is as follows. Does it ever get claustrophobic in space? Hey, Raj Mia, that is a really good question, because it, and it's a really reasonable one to ask, because we are in a very uh, confined vehicle. The great thing about the space station is it's roomy. Like, we, our modules are pretty big. So we actually have the interior volume of about a 747. Uh, we have seven people living up here, um, but it does not, it doesn't feel claustrophobic. There's, there's a lot of modules. It feels busy sometimes. There's a lot of modules up here and there's a lot of work going on, but it never feels uh, like a confining environment. I think part of that's due to the fact that we have such good crewmates up here. Hello, I'm Rainey Guilford, Program Director for the United States Senate Youth Program. And on behalf of all of the 104 2021 USSYP student delegates, thank you amazing NASA astronauts for being so generous with your time and taking so many questions. And I would like to also, on behalf of the program, thank everyone at NASA, especially Rob Navius and his amazing crew in Houston, and Mr. John Gain at NASA headquarters for keeping this enduring partnership between NASA and the Senate Youth Program strong. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure, thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event, thank you. For the help guys. Thank you to all participants. Thank you, Kate and Victor. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communication.